Then, of course, uh, talking about also what we learned uh, and why does that matter? And then most importantly, I think, what are some things that you all can take back to your online donation process and maybe put into place to enjoy better retention uh, and uh, just a better donor experience for your donors uh, on the whole? So let's see, what did we study? Well, this year I have been busy making uh, small $25 donations to 300 organizations across the United States. Uh, what we did uh, was segment out six national accounts, what we call them. So we did Habitat for Humanity, Boys and Girls Club, Humane Society, Feeding America, free clinics and Meals on Wheels, and we donated $25 to 50 organizations in each of those six categories. Uh, so one in every state. And then uh, we looked at, the, at, at what happened with that. So uh, we looked at the donation experience up front, right? So looked at things like, uh, do organizations give you payment flexibility options or is it just straight credit card that they offer? Can I leave a gift in honor or memory of someone? Uh, do I have the ability to designate which fund the gift drops into? Uh, and then I also looked at what happened after the gift was made. So is there a landing page that I'm redirected to uh, on the organization's website or is it on a third party site? Uh, is there a follow-up email that gets sent out automatically? Uh, and is that email personalized or is it more of a straight up receipt? Uh, and then was I maybe added to a newsletter list? Was I invited to an event or a tour? Or what, were, what did the correspondence look like after that gift was made for the following 30 days? And uh, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So I have on my other screen, a spreadsheet with the results from these 300 donations uh, with the totals and the percentages and all that stuff. So when you see me look over there, that's what I'm doing. I'm referencing those numbers there, but we're gonna talk through uh, as at an aggregate level, all of those 300 donations, what happened and what can we learn from those experiences? So uh, here's the, the, the bottom line. Again, $25, so not huge gifts, but not nothing either. A good intro level gift for a lot of people is $25. Most people, in other words, aren't gonna start off with a $1,000 gift to you. They're gonna test the water a little bit. And we really wanted to see what was gonna happen. And uh, the results really are pretty interesting. The biggest takeaway tip that I'm going to emphasize probably a couple of times today is the one that you see here on this slide. Please, when we are done, go give yourself a donation. Go give yourself 20 bucks, give yourself $5. Give yourself more than that if you want, no judgment. Uh, give yourself however much you want, but look and see what happens. I can't tell you how disappointing it is when I go to an organization's website and I see the little donate now button in the upper right hand corner and it doesn't work. I click where it says donate and nothing happens. There's a broken link uh, or the button doesn't work or whatever and, and I can't donate. Uh, there was one uh, just a couple of weeks ago where it worked sort of but you had to click it just right. I, I really had to maneuver my mouse really carefully over the like the O and the word donate. And that was the only way that I could click through and get to that form. So look for things like that. Look for what happens when the gift is, is made. Am I, what does that landing page look like? Am I on my website or a third party? You know, look at all of that and try if you can to look at it through the eyes of a brand new donor. Are they uh, getting a good experience? Are there a whole bunch of clicks, like a shopping cart situation that they have to click through in order to actually make the gift? What does everything look like from the perspective of a brand new donor? We wanna make that as easy as possible for them. So is that happening? Or again, is that process a little more difficult? So please, 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 when we're done today, uh, go give yourself an online donation and see what you think. Uh, better yet, ask your, your partner to, or ask a friend to, or something like that, and see if they have any feedback because uh, you'll be surprised sometimes at what catches people's eyes. So here are the five basic areas that we studied. We've kind of broken this down into these five buckets. We're gonna dig in and talk about uh, some details in each of those buckets as we go. So here's what we learned. 
uh, with the donation experience itself, we looked at these areas right here. We looked at whether or not we were asked to cover the processing fees. As I'm sure you all are aware, that's become a lot more prevalent in the, the eight years since I've been a Bloomerang. Hardly anyone was doing it back then. Almost everyone is doing it now, or at least has that option. Uh, so we looked at whether or not that was available for donors to choose to cover those processing fees. But then we also looked at whether or not the donor was required to cover the processing fees. So in other words, was that little checkbox or that slider bar or whatever it was, was that pre-checked and I as a donor have to go in and uncheck that if I don't want to cover those fees? How did that look? How did that make me feel as a donor? That sort of thing. So we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Then we looked at gifts in tribute or in memorial, designating the fund, were there other uh, payment options? And then finally, did you ask to uh, for them to put themselves on your newsletter list? So was there an option for them to get further communications? Could they opt into that or did that already happen automatically? That sort of thing. So asking to cover fees versus requiring them to cover fees, this is one of those things that I think many of the online donation platforms out there uh, have started to put into play. Uh, and it's one of those things that I think needs to be done for sure. Uh, I would urge you to be careful when you're thinking about whether or not you're going to require your donor to cover those fees. So in other words, is that box pre-checked? I've give, I, I won't name names, but I've given a lot of donations on some platforms that not only require you to uh, uncheck that box, but there are other levels as well. So uh, some systems call it tipping, for instance. Uh, and that's that's a lot of work for your donors to do. Your donors want to go and give you $50, $100, whatever it is that they want to give you. Maybe they are fine with covering that. And if there's a little checkbox there that they can click, then they're going to do that. Uh, but if they feel like they're being manipulated or if they feel like they're being taken advantage of that, oh, I, I want to give you $100. I didn't want to give you $104 and then tip another $10 or something like that. You're, you're leaving them with a bad taste in their mouth. And sometimes they may not even complete that donation. Uh, so make sure you think through all of that through the lens of how is this going to leave our donors feeling about us? when they're done with this transaction, because we want to make sure that they leave with a positive experience or they're not likely to come back. Uh, so it, this is one of those things that kind of comes down to personal choice, whether we're going to ask people or require them to. For me personally, I come down on the ask and let them make that decision. Uh, if you have thought through it carefully and you feel like requiring is the best way to do it, not, not something I necessarily agree with, but I certainly understand your perspective there. Uh, different payment options are really important. Uh, so I, when I donate, I give everything via credit card. Uh, that goes for all of my work donations, but also for the personal donations that my wife and I make. Everything is done with credit card. However, if you all are one of the many, many, many organizations that are interested in capturing those younger donors, then we need to start thinking about appealing to them where they are and making sure that we can give them the payment options that they need. So a quick funny story uh, about my family. Uh, my 22-year-old attends the University of Virginia. I'm pointing that way because that's where it is, uh, 30 miles that way. Uh, she attends the uh, UVA and she called me a couple of months ago and said, Dad, I got this organization that I volunteer with off campus and I really want to give a donation to them, but I can't. I said, well, what, what do you mean, honey? And she said, well, they accept credit cards, uh, but I don't have a credit card. I only have a debit card, so I can't give them a gift. And I laughed and I can't see you now. And so you can laugh at my my 22 year old. It's absolutely fine. Uh, it's a little funny to those of us who you know grew up and know how all that stuff works. But she didn't know how that works. She uses Venmo for everything. Um, in fact, I'm I'm fairly certain if I look at my phone right now, there's probably a Venmo request from her for tacos or pizza or something right now. Uh, that's just the way that, that that generation communicates. That's the way that they pay for things. Venmo, Google Wallet, Apple Pay, that, that's how they do things. So it worked out for her, right? Because her dad happens to work in this field and I know how things work and I, oh yeah, no problem, Faith. You can just put your debit card in, everything's good to go. But if she didn't have that resource and didn't have any idea who to call, 
uh, then that organization would have just missed out on whatever size that donation was, as well as the future relationship with that person and the opportunity to build on that and engage with her. So if that's an option for you, make sure that you make that uh, accessible for your donors, because that really is going to pay off, especially as you're looking for that the, the next couple of generations there. Love the idea of making sure that you can offer the ability to your donors to designate a fund. So in other words, does this go to our general operating fund or is there a specific programmatic area that our uh, donors are interested in? One of the reasons that I love that specifically is because then you can follow up with them on down the line when a very specific need comes up in that programmatic area. So in other words, if you all are uh, building a new facility that's going to house this new program or something like that, you can go back and run a report of everyone who is uh, donated to that specific fund in the last year, two years, however long back you want to, uh, however far back you want to go, and then make a direct appeal again to those people and say, hey, in the past, this has been really important to you. We really need your help now. Uh, we really wanted to reach out to you specifically to find out if this would be something you'd be interested in. So I love that idea a lot if you're able to do that. And then tribute memorial gifts are kind of a no-brainer as well because that's a real emotional connection. So when you're able to allow your donors to get in there and give those gifts in honor of someone who has passed away or yeah, maybe it's a pet that has passed or something like that, you're really cementing the emotional bond and connection you have. So if you're able to do that, would really urge you to, to take a look at that. What we've seen is that uh, about a little more than 60% of the organizations across the U.S. are, are doing that, and, and I'd love to see that, that number get a little bit higher, which reminds me to go back and talk about some of the other numbers. I apologize. Uh, we're at about 60% of organizations now that are asking donors to cover the fees, only about a little bit less than 30% are requiring donors to cover the fees. Uh, and then only 10% are offering something above and beyond credit cards. So I think that's a real big area of opportunity. If your online donation provider has that capability, think about getting that enabled in your system because that's going to make a big difference moving forward. Okay. Uh, then newsletter uh, is a big uh, uh, key as well. So this is something that's really nice to be able to do. Usually it's just a little checkbox somewhere that says, yes, I would like to receive future communications or I want to hear more from you or something along those lines. Uh, so if you are able to add that in, that's a really good idea as well. Only about a quarter of the organizations that I donated to gave that as an option. Uh, so it'd be great to see that number bump up some over the next uh, couple of years if possible. Okay, so we're going to talk some about the landing page, uh, and that's how I have defined what happens after a gift is made, right? So I go to your website, I click on that Donate Now button, I enter all my information into the form, I put my credit card number in, I hit Submit. What happens after that? Where do I go? So you, sometimes you get the little screen up that says, you know, gift is processing. What happens after that? Am I on a third-party website? Am I back on your home screen? Am I back on some landing page on your website? What happens? And maybe more importantly than that is, are there other opportunities for me to engage with you at that point? So even if you take me to a third party website, are there some links back to your website that I can click on? Uh, better yet, if I'm on your website, is there a really easy place for me to get more information about how I can uh, further engage with you? So maybe some volunteer opportunities. Uh, maybe there's an upcoming uh, events page that you have that you could redirect me to or something like that. So in other words, is there the chance for me to keep digging in and keep finding out more information about you and really keep engaging with you? Or... Am I going to have to very purposefully navigate back to your website from some other website or some other landing page that's not connected to you at all? Uh, a lot of people, when they donate, that's it, they're done. They're going to go off and do whatever they're going to do next. But there will be people who want to find out more and who want to engage with you. So make sure that you give them that opportunity if you can. Uh, what we found, uh, or what I found when we when I made these uh, donations, is that only about 42% uh, 
of the organizations had the landing page on their website versus on a third party website. So if that's something, again, that your provider has uh, the capability of hosting or allowing you to host, I guess I should say, I would, uh, I would definitely think about that um, uh, if, if possible. So uh, landing page on the organization's website here. Uh, again, you want to make the the make it as easy as possible to donate, and make it as easy as possible for them to continue to find out more information. And then, one of the I think real missed opportunities that we have uh, is engaging information on that landing page. Uh, so only about a little bit less than forty percent of people had some sort of link uh, on that landing page. And I have to tell you, I was pretty generous with that. So if you think about a landing page uh, that is just your website with your navigation bar up top uh, and then a little, you know, a little form that says, thank you for your donation, look for an email receipt soon or something like that. As long as you had the navigation bar, I counted that as having links. What is even better if you're able to do it on that landing page is to have some dedicated links off to the side, maybe a video or something like that, where people can engage and again, go find those volunteering opportunities and that sort of thing. Uh, so if you're able to work that out, have that landing page on your website where it's a dedicated landing page with some links and all of that, a video, that would be really great. That's a wonderful way to engage with your donors. Uh, and then uh, again, are you trying to continue that relationship as you go or is it just kind of thanks for your gift see you later so the more that you can engage with people uh, the better off you're going to be there so here are a couple of examples uh, that that uh, i i took there uh, you've got here uh, this is a little bit business like for me I, I think it's really good that they say thank you up at the very top i think that's fantastic uh, so the more that uh, uh, you can say thank you on those pages, we're going to talk about the emails in a couple of minutes, the more that you can thank your donors, uh, the better off you're going to be. Um, this is uh, an example of a PayPal landing page here. So when you're using PayPal, uh, sometimes they'll redirect you back to your homepage. Sometimes they don't. I, I don't. I don't understand exactly how that works. But if you have the option to redirect people back, that's great. Uh, I have noticed that there's a bit of a, a time lapse there. It seems to take 10 or 15 seconds before that redirect actually happens. Uh, faster is better because someone's going to get on that page there and then say, oh, okay, I guess I'm done. And they go off and they look at the, you know, Facebook or whatever they do after that. Uh, so if you can get that to happen a little bit faster, that's, that's usually a good idea when possible. And, uh, I love this one. I uh, threw this example in there because uh, they have a video. Um, so a video is such a great way to engage with people really quickly. They just click on the little red button. They hear a quick short message from you uh, and, and it, it gives them the warm, fuzzy feelings and all of that. So when you're able to do that sort of thing, that's fantastic. Okay, so let's talk about the receding email here. I'm going to slide over a little bit. There we go. Uh, so most systems will set this up to run automatically, right? So a lot of times you can customize it a little bit, personalize it. Uh, sometimes you can't. Uh, if you can't, uh, talk with your, your provider there about how you can get in there and customize things. That would be best. So uh, these were the areas that we looked at. And again, we also looked at uh, links uh, and all of that, like we did with the landing page. So is there an opportunity for someone to get that receipt? Oh, okay, good. They got my donation. Fantastic. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I would like to click on that link and learn more about the volunteering opportunities. So uh, a nice way to re-engage with them if you are able to. Where did my mouse go? There we go. Okay. So was a receipt emailed? This is pretty basic and pretty critical. Uh, really need to get that email receipt out the door. Thankfully, 96, 96% of the organizations that I donated to did indeed email a receipt. I will say this is uh, this underscores the importance of uh, giving yourself an online donation because I was a little surprised that a few of these receipts ended up in my spam folder. Uh, so I had to go and hunt them down and search for them, uh, which wasn't great. Uh, if we can avoid that, that would be fantastic. Uh, but it does seem like the vast majority of people have this setup, which is which is great. Uh, having said that, 
when we talk about the receipt being personalized, that wasn't as good. Only 50% were personalized. And, and I was pretty lenient with grading this as well. So if it had my name on it, if it said thank you, uh, I counted that as being personalized and customized. Uh, but there were a lot of systems out there that only sent like a straight up receipt. That's all I can describe it as. It clearly viewed the donation as only a transaction. And it, I might as well have bought a, uh, you know, bought something off eBay or something like that. And I was getting a receipt from that sort of purchase. So not a lot of engaging content. A lot of them didn't have my name anywhere. Uh, didn't have, you know, no, nothing that said thank you, anything like that. So again, give yourself a donation and look at that receipt carefully and see, does it make me feel like I just bought something from Amazon or does it make me feel like I am supporting this cause and this mission that I feel so passionate about? Uh, because if it's the second one, good. If it's the first one, is there an opportunity there for us to improve that perhaps? Uh, and a couple of real world examples here. I love, love, love when organizations add in those cool photos. So when you're able to add those in, it just, it makes me as a donor feel good. I get those warm, fuzzy feelings. I feel like, oh yes, I've helped these kids. I've helped these families. Uh, I'm helping people in my community because that's why I donated in the first place. I want to make an impact right here where I live. I want to help people who are my neighbors, who go to school with my kids. I want to help the people that I'm living close to. And, and you give me some pictures of some people and it makes me feel like that's what I accomplished. So when you're able to do that, love that idea. And then as you can see, you can have the receiving information. You probably should have the receiving information with this example over here on the left. So you've got, okay, here's the, the gift and all of that kind of stuff. You've got the processing information there. So all of that is available, uh, but then you're also taking the opportunity to tell me a little bit what I've accomplished with that donation, which is really, really important too. So lots of good stuff that you can do to, again, engage with your donors after that gift has been made uh, through that receiving uh, email. Okay, so our thank you processes. Uh, we wanna look here at, at what happens after that receipt for the next 30 days. So is there a hard copy? Uh, letter that's mailed? Uh, how about a thank you phone call? Uh, was there a, a personalized, customized thank you email? Uh, and so generally the personalized, customized thank you email is more of a one-off, right? It's not automated, uh, or if it is automated, it's hard for the donor to know that it was automated. So a lot of times it's just a quick note from the executive director or the development director or something like that. And it just to me, so there's not a big long distribution list or anything like that. It just says, James, thanks so much for your gift. Maybe ask a question, maybe invite to an event, something like that. But nice, short, sweet, doesn't have to be a novel. But that kind of engagement really, really helps a lot. So we'll, we'll talk about that as we go as well. Okay, so thank you letters. Have a lot of organizations that send those out, uh, right? So only less than 1% sent out a thank you letter within the first five days. So clearly those processes take a while. We're waiting, we're doing those once a week, once every two weeks. That's cool, totally understand. I know how busy everybody is, totally get it. Uh, if you look at the number that sent a thank you letter within the first, uh, uh, what was it, 15 days, that was at 14%. And then within the first month was 22%. So one in five, roughly, uh, are getting a thank you letter out the door uh, within the first 30 days. So think through which of your donors that's going to matter to. If you all are one of the organizations that already has a good base of younger donors, that may not matter to them as much. Everybody likes to get mail, so maybe it does, but younger donors probably prefer to communicate via email and text and all of that sort of thing. But if you have an older donor uh, population, they probably do want to get uh, the, those thank you letters in the mail. So what does that process look like? How long is it taking you to get those thank you letters out the door? And is there the possibility that maybe we could do it a little more quickly? If we're looking at uh, a month and I'm only getting one in five organizations that are sending me a thank you letter, 
there might be the opportunity to make that a little bit faster or even just to send a thank you letter at all. So definitely something to think about there. So we wanna talk for a minute about a thank you call uh, and why is this important? And, and I'm sure there are some of you already right now who are rolling their eyes because uh, I, again, I understand completely, you already have so much to do wearing so many different hats in your organization and trying to accomplish so much. The idea of picking up the phone and calling a donor and being stuck on the call with them for 15 minutes even just seems like it's a huge chore. Well, we at Bloomerang took a look at uh, why it's so important to make those thank you phone calls. And hopefully what you'll see is that it's worth the effort to put in there. So we uh, looked at, we did a study and looked at three different areas, which we're going to talk about here in a second, for what happened when those phone calls were made. Uh, the idea here is that when you call your donor, you're able to first express thanks, but then also ask them some other questions moving forward that may be helpful. Uh, so absolutely, that third one there on this screen right now, uh, fill in any missing contact information, that's a great idea. If something didn't come through properly or they neglected to fill something out, absolutely. Uh, but you also can uh, look at that first bullet point there, thinking about donor motivation. Again, if you have one specific area of your programs or your services that this donor is really passionate about, wouldn't it be pretty helpful to know that? That way, on down the line, the next time you run an appeal, you can craft that appeal, whether it's email or letter or whatever it is, you can craft it to that person and to what they are most passionate about. That's going to increase the likelihood of success that they're going to respond to it, but it will also potentially increase the size of their gift. If that's something that they're really passionate about, then they're going to want to support it as much as possible. So think through all of that uh, as much as you can. Um, for years and years and years, we've seen the, something like this statistic. There's a couple of different statistics floating around, but but it's it's like this. Four times more likely to give a second gift. Wow, uh, just wow. Uh, so one phone call uh, does that. That's absolutely incredible. And then a thank you call from a board member to a newly acquired donor within 24 hours will increase their next gift by 40%. I remember looking at this five or six years ago and thinking, really? Really? Kind of channeling my inner Seth Meyers and, and Amy Poehler, for those of you who are about my age and, and you know, Weekend Update fans there. Uh, a little skeptical on that one. That seemed a little too good to be true. So I, I think there were a lot of people at Bloomerang that felt that way. So we decided to study the data that we have. Uh, we work with uh, over 16, 17,000 nonprofits at this point. Uh, so we looked at what happened when organizations made these thank you phone calls and compared that to organizations that didn't make those thank you phone calls. And we looked at it in three different areas. The first is the likelihood that those donors would be retained. And what we found is pretty striking. If you make those phone calls, the retention rate almost doubles. Uh, I'll be rounding up and down a lot in the next couple of minutes. Uh, I have degrees in English and in art history, and I don't like math. So be forewarned, rounding up, rounding down a lot. Uh, but as you can see here, that retention rate almost doubles uh, just by making the, the phone calls. I will throw out there again, I know that a lot of you are going, James, dude, I can't make one set of thank you phone calls. I don't have enough time for that, much less two would strongly urge you to pull your board into those conversations. I sit on the board of a small farm uh, here in the Shenandoah Valley. Again, it's that direction for those of you who are interested. Uh, and uh, we're a, a community farm. We you know, give food to schools and, and do SNAP benefits and all kinds of really cool stuff. Uh, and, and our executive director uh, asked those of us on the board a while back to make some of these thank you phone calls. Uh, and, and as board members, we were absolutely delighted. We tripped over ourselves lining up to uh, schedule shifts. No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Uh, we, we kicked and screamed and had to be begged and cajoled and all of that, as you would expect. Uh, but you know what happened? Most of us kind of liked it. Actually, 
liked it a lot. We had a couple of people that said, okay, that was fun. I don't want to do that anymore. But the majority of the board said, that was really cool. Uh, you only asked me to make, you know, five or whatever the number was last month. I could do a couple more, throw, throw some more my way. That was fun. As board members, we get so focused on the week to week, day to day staffing and budgeting and all that kind of stuff that sometimes we lose sight of the really cool stuff that the organization is doing and the impact that it's having. So then when you have the opportunity to listen to a brand new donor who says, oh my gosh, this was so cool. I took my kid on a field trip to your farm. She dug in the dirt with her hands and weeded things and pulled beets out. And now she won't stop talking about beets. I don't even know what a beet is and I don't know how to cook it, but she wants me to cook with it. And it's the coolest thing that's ever happened to us. Those are really cool stories. Uh, and by the way, that whole beat story is what happened when we took our youngest on a field trip to the farm. And that's how I ended up being on the board a couple of years later, because it was really, really cool. Uh, so those are the stories that your board members can hear when they call your donors. Uh, get them involved, get them excited. And, and it, it's kind of refreshing and renewing to see the organization from that different perspective. So all of that to say, don't feel like you need to do all of this yourself. Get other staff people uh, to make those phone calls, same idea. Sometimes their heads down in uh, different areas of the organization, and they need that different perspective. Get your board members. Get get uh, a volunteer phone bank to jump on the phone once a month. Lots of different options, because as you'll see here, really good things happen when you make those calls. So, again, likelihood that they are retained goes through the roof. That's awesome. Let's think about the speed to the second gift. So in other words, if we don't make any phone calls, it takes about three quarters of a year or so uh, before they'll make their second gift. One phone call, a little more than half a year, uh, and then more than one phone call, holy mackerel. Uh, then we drop all the way down to less than two months. So just by making those phone calls, we can make that connection with people. We can really draw them in and engage them. And that results in a much faster second gift. And the reason that is important is if you look at donor retention rates overall, your first time donors are only retained about 20% of the time. But once they become a repeat donor, they are retained 60% of the time. So the faster we can get them from the first gift to the second gift, the better off our retention rate is going to be. So by making two phone calls, we can go from three quarters of a year to two months. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's jump all over that. That's a really good, good idea. And then the last area that we looked at at Bloomerang was the size of the second gift. Uh, and, and in line with what Penelope Burke said, which should surprise absolutely no one, she's uh, wonderful and knows exactly what she's talking about. Uh, the size of that second gift did indeed go way up. Uh, so what we found was that it doubles. So there you go. Three different reasons why making those phone calls are a really good idea. Uh, the likelihood that they make a second gift goes way up, the second gift comes a lot faster, and the second gift is a lot bigger. Three wins just by jumping on the phone. So I uh, would definitely throw that out there as something that uh, would strongly urge you all to think about. And I would strongly urge you to think about it because I can say with relative certainty that most people are not doing this. Uh, I got a phone call less than 1% of the time. In fact, if my eyes are reading this correctly, it's 0.013% of the time. So like a tenth of a percent of the time of, of these 300 donations that I made, I actually got a phone call. That's not great. That's not great. I think we can we can definitely do better than that. And then the last area that we looked at, of course, are those personalized thank you emails. That's the one-off where you as the executive director, development director, somebody just types out a quick 10-second email that just says, hey, James, thanks so much for your gift. We're excited to have you part of our impact family or something like that. Uh, that, that gives you a, a really nice uh, feeling as a donor. If you ask a question or better yet, ask them if they have any questions as a donor, it gives them the opportunity to, to correspond with you and engage with you further. So lots of wins that can happen from those, those 10 second emails that you, that you send out. Uh, and, and I got this, I wasn't surprised. This was about 16% of the time. It doesn't surprise me that it's that low. I do think that's a real easy 
quick win and a, a really good opportunity for improvement for most organizations. It really doesn't take a lot of time to do that. And it's a really nice engagement tool. So a couple of, uh, of examples here. Uh, I love this right here. Thanks for your being a first time donor. So that tells me as a donor that they were interested enough to figure out which category I fall into and then send an email out uh, and, and treat me a little bit differently, which is fantastic. Love, 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 love this. Wanted to see what spurred you to support and if I can answer any questions. So again, really quick and easy, not writing a book or anything like that, just quick hitting, da 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 this person up here probably copied and pasted. That's cool. Still have a really nice little video that they put into place down there. So that's highly engaging as well. When you can drop in those different points of contact and, and different touches, you're going to uh, go a really long way in keeping those donors interested and keeping them engaged with you, which is what you want. <clears throat> Excuse me. So follow-up actions then after that. Uh, email, newsletter, uh, is there the opportunity for me to maybe go do something on site, whether that's a tour, an event, volunteer activity? Did we email? Did we make a phone call? Was there a second donation ask in the first 30 days? Uh, and then was there an opportunity or an invitation to join some sort of recurring donation? Uh, so lots of different possibilities here for what to do after that gift is, has been made and, and you know when you're sending out those uh, those thank yous and all of that. So uh, why does all of this matter? We're going to go look at all of those numbers here in just a minute. Uh, but why, why it matters is because it's a lot cheaper to retain a donor than it is to acquire one. So lots of different numbers floating around with this as well. But what we generally hear is that for every $1 you raise from an existing donor, it costs the organization about a quarter. Whereas for every $1 you raise from a brand new donor, it costs the organization about $1.25. So you're actually losing money a lot of times with those brand new donors, with that donor acquisition. And if we start thinking about why that might be, I think it makes sense. Uh, so most of the time you're looking at one of two things. Most organizations use either direct mail or events for donor acquisition, both of which are fairly costly. Uh, if you're thinking about your event, let's say you're hosting a golf tournament or you have a gala or something like that, you're expending a lot of time, energy, and money into that to make sure that the catering runs great, you've got the right event venue, uh, you wanna make sure that you have items for your auction. There's all kinds of time and effort that are being spent that your staff cannot spend on furthering relationships with your existing donor base. Uh, then on top of that, you're also having to spend money on the venue and the catering and the auction items and all of that. And listen, events are a fact of life. I think that we should run those and I think we should run great events and go to great lengths to make sure that they're fun and engaging and we get a lot of people in the door and all of that. But if we're not then following up with people afterwards, we're really losing an enormous opportunity. So you have people who attend your events, they're feeling connected, they're feeling engaged, they're saying, man, I love the mission, I love the, the impact videos that are shown during the gala, and I love all of the testimonials and, and all of that that have come. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write a check. Yeah, I just, I feel great about this. I really wanna support this organization. Well, we want to make sure we connect with them after that feeling fades a little bit too. We want to make sure that we connect with them and, and get them to keep coming back. And the same thing is true with your online donations as well, because again, you're doing something to drive people to, uh, to making those donations online and whatever is driving them is probably costing you something. So we want to make sure that we're getting a good return on an investment there. So to that point, the average donor retention rates, I mentioned this a couple of minutes ago, gave you a preview there. Uh, your first time donors are only retained 20% of the time. So whether they're coming to your event or they're responding to some sort of an appeal or whatever, one in five are donating again. I'm not great at math, but I don't think that's great. And as I mentioned a minute ago, if we can get them into the, the bucket there on the right, the repeat donors, we go from one in five to three in five coming back year out of year. 
year after year. So what can we do then to move them from that bucket on the left to the bucket on the right? That's what we're talking about today is, is uh, are some of those things that you can do. Adrian Sargent, Sargent, 20 years ago, did a survey, just asked people, why'd you stop donating? Gave them a whole bunch of different options, let people choose as many of those options as they wanted. You can see that we've highlighted some here. Those are things that we can do something about. The ones that aren't highlighted, look, if somebody can't afford it anymore, there's not a lot that you can do to, to change their mind, nor should you, uh, really. But the ones that are highlighted, yeah, you can you can make some adjustments and make some changes there. And really, I think the four on the left can be boiled down to the one that's highlighted on the right. So poor service or communication. In other words, your donors want to hear about what's going on. They want to know what kind of an impact they're making when they give you some of their money. What what's happening? What, who's, whose lives are being affected? Who, who is being impacted? What kind of change is happening in my community? They want to hear those stories. Uh, that's kind of the bottom line. On the flip side of that, Donor Voice uh, 10, 10 ish years ago uh, did a study and, and just asked people, why did they start? Why do they keep giving? Why do they continue to give? Uh, and as you can see here, there are a lot of different reasons they perceive the organization to be effective, timely, thank you. I really like number seven, a donor receives info showing who is being helped. Have to be careful with privacy concerns, 100%. So if you need to make things anonymous, uh, totally cool. Do, do what you need to do with that, no worries. Uh, but if you're able to tell anonymous stories or able to tell actual stories, uh, those are things that donors respond to really, really nicely. And the follow-up after the gift is made, after that thank you letter is sent, think about the email newsletter, that sort of thing. Those are all really important pieces of that because you're continuing to communicate with them and continuing to tell those stories and show them the impact that their donations continue to have in their community. That's what your donors really want to, to hear about. They want that emotional connection to drive donations. Uh, that's gonna firm up those donations as, as you can go. So when you think about telling stories, think about what makes a good story. We all like stories, whether it's TV, books, uh, movies. And I think really the number one bullet right there, character is what it boils down to. So if you think about TV shows that you've watched or books that you've read, movies that you've seen, uh, we've all read books or watched movies or whatever and kind of gone, oh, okay, that was cool. Uh, I enjoyed that. But then we've also read books, watched movies, keep watching TV shows where we're really sucked in, right? And we're really passionate about them. And we can't wait to tell our friends or our family or whoever about that book that we just read because it's so cool. And most of the time, I think if we take a moment and think back about that, it's because of characters, really good character development. We want to see what happens next to those characters. We want to see what they're going to do, what choices they make and what impact that has. So think through the characters that you have available to you when you're telling those stories about the impact that you're having in the community and really by extension, the impact that your donors are having. Uh, harness the power of those characters when you're telling your stories to show your impact. So uh, sending a newsletter. Uh, this is something that hopefully your, your email newsletter software, maybe it's in your donor database, maybe it's something separate. Hopefully you can get all that to kind of talk to each other and integrate in and, and all of that. If that's not something that you're doing now, think about trying to figure out how you can do that because those newsletters are really important. They keep people up to date and they keep people informed about what is happening. Only uh, about 11.5% of the organizations that I donated to put me on some sort of email newsletter cadence. So again, that's a really big opportunity for improvement and hopefully one that isn't too big of a heavy lift. Hopefully it's something that's not too difficult to do. Uh, think about, again, calling those, uh, those, those donors and asking them to come in to take a tour asking them to come in and go to an event, uh, maybe a volunteer. In other words, get them on site so that they can see firsthand what you're doing and the impact that you're having. Some way to get them to you so that you can talk with them so that they can see the passion that you have for the work that you're doing and how important it is and how necessary it is. 
I did not, this did not happen very often at all, uh, whether a phone call or an email invitation or even a mailed invitation, uh, all of that was less than 1% of the time uh, that I got invited. So think about throwing that into your repertoire. I think that'll really pay dividends because the more that you can get donors to see firsthand the difference that they're going to make while they are supporting you, uh, the better off that connection is going to be. Um, and then think about how you want to segment the communication moving forward. So I've already alluded to this a couple of times, uh, but if you think about how do we tell those stories to people that really care about those stories specifically, programmatically? Well, let's think back. Are we giving them the opportunity to tell us in the donation process which areas programmatically they're interested in and they're passionate about? Because if we are, then we can segment out those communications later on and figure out uh, how to approach them a little bit differently. So lots of different ways to think about it. At Bloomerang, we talk all the time about segmenting out by capacity. So thinking, you know, well, these folks have a lower capacity. We're going to send an email to them that's going to ask them to become part of our monthly donor campaign. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. And then approaching the folks with higher capacity a little bit differently. So think through how you, those different segments that you have uh, and how you can approach them a little bit differently. So again, as we're, we're wrapping up here, tell stories that matter, uh, ask for recurring gifts and use segmentation. Those are some really powerful tips and tools that you can, that you can throw in there. So thinking about uh, kind of kind of finishing up here, uh, you can want to make it as easy as possible to donate. Please, please, please go give yourself an online donation when we're done. See what that process looks like. Again, can't tell you how frustrating it is to identify a group that I want to donate to and then I can't find their donate button or the donate button doesn't work or it's a multi-step process where I have to click through a whole bunch of screens and it's kind of a pain in the neck. Make it as easy as possible for your donors. Uh, they want to donate, so make it easy for them to donate. And then think through all the other things that we've talked about. What happens after that gift is made? Uh, is there the opportunity for us to jump on the phone with them and, and engage with them at that point? Can we personalize the communication a little more effectively than we've been doing? Can we reach out to the donors and invite them to tours and volunteering activities and so on? So think through kind of how we can approach donors. Is there a cadence that we can drop into place so that we have uh, processes in place for those donors once they make those donations? Uh, my email is here. Please feel free to, to reach out. In fact, I will make this offer to you all that I make at conferences when I give presentations like this. I will be happy to visit your online donation form. I'll be happy to give you a gift and then to email you uh, with uh, some opportunities for improvement. So if you would like to do that, take a picture, write down my email address, whatever's easiest, send me an email and I'm happy to do that. And, and usually it takes me less than 24 hours, but I'll get back to you pretty quickly with all of that. So please feel free to do that if that would be helpful. And Danny, I think that's about everything. I'll turn it turn it back over to you. Great. This is a perfect time with that plug you just gave. I'm going to launch a poll for everyone. If you, when you registered, you didn't check that box to hear more from Bloomerang and you'd want to hear more after listening to that great presentation from James, you can just click that box right there and I'll make sure to get your information over to them so that they can reach out to you. I won't talk too much because we have a handful of questions in our chat from today, James. So I'll just get rolling into them. Rochelle asked, usually when they send a picture in the email, it's getting stripped out. So they're, we're wondering if you have any thoughts or suggestions on how to deal with that. Yeah, it's a good uh, good question. And, and a lot of that has to do with the provider. So you can have a conversation with them about uh, all kinds of things. So definitely pictures, but also think about spam filters and stuff like that. Those are conversations that you want to engage with your provider about, because if they're not aware that it's happening, then they can't fix it. They can't make improvements. And I know QGIV is great about this and, and Bloomerang tries to do the same. We get that feedback and then we say, oh, we had no idea that was an issue. So yeah, we definitely want to address it and, and see what we can do. So 
Um, it, it's something to be perfectly frank, I don't have the technical expertise to say that you should use a JPEG versus a PNG image or anything like that. I'm not that smart, I'm afraid. Uh, but if you talk with the support teams associated with your, your product, they probably will have that knowledge and can walk you through some of that. Great. I saw Brendan smile there because I said I'm not that smart, and Brendan knows that that's that's the case. Thanks, Brendan. I appreciate. I, it. I would have given the same exact response, James. Uh, <laughs> you know, definitely steer them back to the folks who know these uh, best practices for sure. <laughs> appreciate that. Absolutely. We'll move on to the next one. Um, Addie's asking. She's curious about what to do about in-kind donations versus monetary. She works at an animal shelter. Would you still use the same practices? for both of those? Absolutely. Um, it's a great question. And uh, if you can track that in your donor database, and hopefully you can, then yes, I would treat those as a monetary donation because someone is taking time, gifting you with their time, their expertise, or gifting you with something that they have purchased or has been given to them or you know, whatever the situation is, whether it's a goods or a service. Uh, they are donating something to you. So the more that you can thank them and show them that you appreciate that, uh, the the better off you're going to be in the long run. That's a really good good call out. Thank you. Great. And if anybody, if you're we're going through these questions and it makes you think of something else, drop those in the chat and we'll try and get to them today. And um, we'll move right along. Um, Stephanie asked if Bloomerang has any additional payment options such as Venmo, PayPal, and Apple Pay or any plans of adding them in the future. We are like this close to adding Venmo and then I think Apple Pay and Google Wallet are right after that. So I think they'll be done by the end of the year if I'm remembering right. Great. And then Rochelle asked, what are your thoughts on organizations putting you on their newsletter instead of opting you opting into the newsletter? Oh, Rochelle, that's such a great question. I uh, it's sticky, right? I we have this debate. I I don't know about Kugit, but it, but Bloomerang has this debate internally all the time about people who have opted in, you know, using our website forms or some other content, or if they've just talked to us at a conference or what we. We debate pretty constantly, and we tend to be a bit more conservative and and kind of say eh, they haven't expressly opted in, so we're not going to include them on some of our distribution lists and all of that. Um, but there are a lot of organizations that that are a little more you know on the other side of that, and I totally understand that as well. Uh, I I would tell you, Rochelle, uh, if you can, if you're going to go ahead and preset them and opt them in automatically into those communications give them the opportunity make sure that they they know that the you know that they can unsubscribe at any time maybe think about sending them a personal email uh, that we talked about earlier where you just say you know thanks so much what prompted you to give or something like that and if they indicate to you in any way shape or form that that they don't want then you go in and and unsubscribe them from from those emails so uh that's it I don't know that there's any, you know, industry-wide best practice that's set in stone or anything like that. But the more, uh, you know, the the more donor input you can get, the better off you're going to be. I think. Absolutely, and I just out of pure curiosity, when you're entering into these research studies, I know it's hard to go into them completely mind clear, not expecting anything. But was there anything that you found that surprised you, or maybe changed your mind about a few different things? I, I'm not going to call anybody out. I uh, was a bit dismayed with how hard it was to un, un uh, check the boxes, I guess, uh, to, to not cover the processing fees and not to tip with a couple of of providers. Um, it was not a good donor experience. So if I, again, if I want to give a hundred bucks, awesome probably won't mind giving 103 104 dollars whatever that ends up being to cover the fees but uh if if i have to really dig around and hunt and find out okay do i check this or wait a minute i'm not sure if that's going to do it you know it, it that's not what i want to spend my time doing uh i don't want to have to you know really dig around and find all that so I, there were a couple of platforms that i thought were bordering on uh uh I uh, harassment. I don't, I don't know what the right word is, but I, I didn't like that at all. 
Uh, aside from that, uh, so that that would cover kind of the donor experience. Uh, I'll be really honest. I, I thought the newsletter ad would be higher. So 20% surprised me. Um, I, I thought it would be 40 to 50%. I, I figured that would be a kind of an easy thing to do. Um, but it, it seems like uh, maybe it's a little harder um, uh, for, for some people, or maybe they're just not doing newsletters. But uh, that one, that one, those, those two things together definitely surprised me more than anything else, I think. Awesome. Yeah, the new, newsletter number surprised me too, James, when you were, I, I had a wide eye moment when you mentioned that it was surprising. Yeah. It's, a, it's such an easy thing, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we simplify it a lot, but it, it, it should be made right. easy by the, the solution you're using. Yep. Yeah, if you're having to figure out how to get information back and forth, and it's it's more of a pain than you want to do. Yeah, time to start evaluating some stuff, I think, because that, like you said, Brendan, that should be a pretty easy thing to, to take care of. Right. Absolutely. We are winding up on three o'clock, so I want to make sure we're respectful of everyone's time, but I want to say thank you again, James, for jumping yes. on today and for laying all of that information out there for us. I know a lot of legwork went into that study, so we really appreciate you coming here and sharing all of that with our audience. Um, I'll add QGIV and James' contact information up there for anybody who missed it before. You can take note of that now, but Brendan, if there's anything you want to add before we go. Just another thank you. That was great, James. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Definitely had some takeaways. And I hope everybody that, that joined did too. Um, I know Bloomerang is always pumping out great content, especially when it's surrounding this type of you know conversion data and retention data. So uh, please, if you all have a, a chance or have questions, reach out, You know, use their contacts, uh, information and their resources, just like we use ours. So uh, happy to have them as partners and, and always take away great value from these types of presentations. So thank you, James. Oh, our, my, my pleasure. You all are a, a blast to work with. So this was a lot of fun today. Thanks for having us. Of course. Awesome. With that, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you so much for joining. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. -bye.